Hello. Uh, all right, I'll just get into it. First here is called Cool Memories 3, 1991 to 1995 by Jean Baudrillard. It's called Fragments. This is a, uh, it's kind of a mix between a journal and a memoir and an autobiography, I think. At least that's how I take it. But it's mostly just like thoughts, fragments, aphorisms, stuff like that. Um, I just picked this out pretty randomly. I was looking at the French philosophy section, I read an interview of him and I saw that he had written a book about America, like a travel, travel log, travel journal. Uh, my library didn't have that, unfortunately, but I saw he wrote several books of these uh, like thoughts. So check it out, and it's pretty hilarious. I got 1991 and 95 because that's when I was born, 95. So all right, here's how it starts. After the best book, the most beautiful woman, or the finest dessert you've ever seen, you tell yourself this is where the rest of your life begins. In fact, something else happens. Another book, another woman, another dessert. And the rest of your life becomes life itself. It was merely the illusion of the end. Even the hope of a definite horizon, a horizon which would stamp what proceeds with an irrevocable quality, is apparently not possible. New deal of life new deal of desire. If everything can seem indifferent when you have encountered the most beautiful of things, why don't we regard the opposite situation as equally fateful? Having read the worst book, having seen the dullest landscape, having met the stupidest, ugliest woman, <laughs> there should be a perfection of, and hence an absolute limit to, the insignificant, the useless, the trivial, and the banal, beyond which, as in the contrary case, they would be nothing more worth waiting for. In fact, it's, it is not that way. After seeing the worst, you do not say, O oh, time, suspend thy flight. <laughs> there is no ecstasy of uselessness. And, uh, yeah, he has a whole bunch. It's really fun. It's really quite funny stuff. Uh, and let's see, what's the other one? Okay, yeah, here's another funny one that's in the first couple pages. The only solution to the drugs problem is to make drugs a universal medium of exchange, the new general equivalent. That way, they would no longer be consumed. Shifting from use value to exchange value, they would become as abstract as gold or paper. You could store several thousand tons of drugs as international reserve funds, the way they do with gold at Fort Knox. For a gold exchange standard, read narcotic exchange standard. So yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of it. It's pretty hilarious. I don't have any interest in his philosophy, really. I guess as of now, but yeah. I really like this stuff, and uh. He really has a distaste for contemporary art. I just turned to this randomly, and it really you could probably turn to one every three pages and find something disparaging modern art but uh, contemporary art when one looks at the emptiness of current art the only question is how such a machine can continue to function in the absence of any new energy in an atmosphere of critical disillusionment and commercial frenzy and with all the players totally indifferent if it can continue how long will this illusionism last. A hundred years? Two hundred? This society is like a vessel whose edges move ever wider apart and in which the water never comes to the boil. Yeah, so that's Baudrillard. Uh, let's see. One other thing that's not really related to books necessarily, well, it is incidentally, because it's based on Dream Story by Arthur Schnitzler, but I recently watched uh, Eyes Wide Shut, <laughs> and my favorite part of the movie was the the music. The uh, Shostakovich in the beginning, the waltz number two, I love that piece so much, and then in the scene where they're doing that ritual thing, 
they play some Romanian liturgy music backwards, and I love that so much. I listen to it. There's a, I can't remember what it's called. If you type in backwards priests into YouTube, it'll come up with it, but there's like an hour-long version where someone has repeated it over and over. I listened to that twice in a row. But yeah, the movie was very interesting. The part I like the most is the uh, the dialogues between the husband and wife, or also the dialogues in the uh, in the mansion. But yeah, it's a good book. Movie. I haven't read the book, but I'm sure it's a good book. I got uh, some plays by Schnitzler though. My school, someone has stolen Dream Story, so they didn't have it, but uh, one of them is called, I think, Rondo or something like that, the play. Basically, every scene is either before or after sex, and it's interesting because, really, I don't think most people would imagine that there would be plays about that published in, I think, like... 1905 or something like that whenever it was published so in that way it's very neat you don't really even have books like that published now at least popular yeah you have books published but <clears throat> like Volman but anyway um, here's another interesting book I found it's a contemporary poet Noah Warren The Destroyer in the Glass and uh, he's pretty good. I think he's like a, related to Robert Penn Warren somehow. I think his grand nephew or something like that. I, I don't know exactly really. Probably have to be <laughs> great nephew. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, the one that's interesting is Automatic Pool Cleaner is the title and uh, yeah I guess I'll read it like the stubborn rover spirit it's insistent in collecting its units of grime if less scientific like a white ray it cruises slowly through teal it's someone's leashed flounder or a menace that has come too close to the surface and now spurts from his tail a warm cupful that misses my leather sandals. Look at him go. Ingeniously independent, he's replaced the pool boy whose dim ghost imbues him with cosmic eros and just a nibble of pathos. But as he tries to force a way into the shallows where scallop steps march down, rise up, he becomes bewildered. His flagellum lashes sadly forth and back. I haul him up and turn him toward the deeper center. Faithful as a Labrador, he scoots away on his errand, and his wake laps my ankles. Isn't everything real entirely real? Plastic shoes, plastic chair, so what? I too have been known to ceaselessly pace a little cell. The lawn fertilized gasps weakly in the dense heat as it grows. Yellow as cake, an inner tube drifts over the snarl of the machine's umbilical. It's Tuesday at three. Friends of mine are off in offices, classrooms, labs, Brazil, or the Bay creating wealth, girding for a future they pursue. But their acquaintance sips icy coffee in his latest attempt to fire his forebrain to a liar. Something he can hold and have that returns more life than it burns. A thing gorgeous, worthless, and self-betraying. O oh, sun on water, O oh, sun on matter, kiss my limbs. My lips as I recline away into this, the prime of my decay. So it's a little sentimental, but that never killed anybody. Well, it may have, but that's besides the point. Okay. And, uh, one other poet that I've been reading that I've been enjoying is Blaze Sendrars. Who, I guess, <laughs> on his Wikipedia page, it says he's the first modernist poet, which, it's like, really? 
But it says he published something in 1907 that was considered modernist poetry, so... I don't know, I suppose it would be. It doesn't matter, though. But the one I like is The Prose of the Trans-Siberian and of Little Jean of France. Because it's really modernist in the way you'd think of modernist, like kind of aphoristic, describing daily life. Um, it's pretty funny, too. It reminds me a lot of Pessoa, really, his uh, Alvaro de Campos style. Back then I was still young. I was barely 16, but my childhood memories were gone. I was 48,000 miles away from where I was born. I was in Moscow, city of a thousand and three bell towers and seven train stations. And the thousand and three towers and seven stations weren't enough for me. Because I was such a hot and crazy teenager that my heart was burning like the temple of Ephesus or like Red Square in Moscow at sunset. And my eyes were shining down those old roads and I was already such a bad poet that I didn't know how to take it all the way. The Kremlin was like an immense tartar cake, iced with gold, with big, blanched almond cathedrals and the honey gold of the bells. An old monk was reading me the legend of Novgorod. I was thirsty, and I was deciphering cuneiform characters. Then, all at once, the pigeons of the Holy Ghost flew up over the square, and my hands flew up too, sounding like an albatross taking off. Ah, well... That's the last I remember of the last day, of the very last trip, and of the sea. Still, I was a really bad poet. I didn't know how to take it all the way. I was hungry in all those days, and all those women, and all those cafes, and all those glasses. I wanted to drink them down and break them. And all those windows, and all those streets, and all those houses, and all those lives, and all those carriage wheels raising swirls from the broken pavement. I would have liked to have rammed them into a roaring furnace, and I would have liked to ground them, ground up all their bones, and ripped out all those tongues, and liquefied all those big bodies naked and strange under the clothes that drive me mad. I foresaw the coming of the big red Christ of the Russian Revolution, and the sun was an ugly sore, splitting apart like a red-hot coal. Goes on for a a little ways, but, yeah, I, <laughs> I like that poem quite a lot. It was written when he was pretty young, too, I think, early 20s. Because I think he was born in, I don't know, I don't want to guess, but I think it was 1887. So that'd make him about 21 when he published it. And then uh, the main thing I've really been reading lately is this anthology of Hungarian poetry, which is like a thousand pages or something of Hungarian poetry called The Quest of the Miracle Stag, translated by Adam Mackay. And... Uh, I was reading this in a cafe, and it was kind of funny <clears throat> because I was I brought it with me in the car, and I was tempted not to bring it in with me because really I didn't want anyone looking at me while I was reading it. But I decided not to be controlled by other people's perceptions, so <laughs> I brought it in with me and. I ordered a brownie and a, uh, like a cappuccino and the girl was, that was at the cash register was like, wow, that's some book. What is it? You know, I think cause it's big <laughs> and, uh, I took my hand off the cover and I said, it's a, it's Hungarian poetry and anthology. <laughs> And the only way I could describe her reaction is like rapid deflation because, yeah, I think somehow she was disappointed. I'm not sure what she was expecting, <laughs> but uh, yeah. 
Uh, well, anyway, this is actually the first poem I turned to when I opened up the anthology, and I actually like it quite a lot. And um, I cannot pronounce Hungarian names, but this is Gyula Juhaz, G U L G Y U L A J U H A S Z, and it's called what was her blondness like? What was her blondness like? I can't remember. But I do know the meadows fair and blonde. When summer yields its wheat, golden and tender, this blondness makes me feel her spirit's bond. What blueness was in her eyes? I can't remember. But when autumn skies open their manse in languished twilights of a soft September, I see her eyes hue as if in a trance. Her silken voice, nor could I this remember, but towards springtime when the meadows sigh, I feel I can hear Anna's voice re-enter from a springtime that's distant like the sky. <laughs> and then uh, the other one, this is the poet that I really like. Apparently he's considered uh, the best lyric poet of the 20th century. And he had a really sad life in the end. He died of schizophrenia after living, what, 32 years? Came from a poor background. Dad died when he was four. Mom couldn't take care of him. <clears throat> Uh, moved around a lot, then he eventually was like more or less adopted by, I think, his aunt's husband, who was a lawyer, and uh, this one he wrote when he was in uh, university, and he got kicked out of the university for it. It's called Song of Innocence. I have no God, I have no land, no father nor a mother's hand. I have no crib or coffin cover, I share no kisses, I have no lover. Three days I have been starving numb, for lack of either feast or crumb. My strength, I'm twenty whole and hale, my twenty years are up for sale. If no one wants to have a try, then let the devil come and buy, and I will jimmy safe and fence, kill too if needed in innocence. Upon a noose they swing me high, then in the good soil will I lie, and tips of poison grasses start to prick above my splendid heart. And another poet, I think I mentioned him on here already, but Miklos Rednoti, he was a pretty famous poet, but uh, really he got huge fame after he was uh, taken prisoner during the Holocaust and he was killed on a death march and when his body was found several months later they found a notebook in his pocket, shirt pocket that had like 30 something poems I think written on it and it was then published and became a symbol of like survival after the Holocaust and uh, the uh, triumphance of art after a catastrophe. And then there's another interesting poet that I've, poet and novelist, that I found through this. Uh, I don't know how to say his name, Dezo Kostolanyi, something like that. He wrote uh, Cornel Esti and Skylark. I've been reading Cornel Esti, which is a very funny book. Uh, I was in a fairly bad mood the other day, and it had me laughing very hard, so that was nice. Let's see. Yeah, this Saturday in two days there's the Texas Book Festival and I was considering going but I've decided not to 
it has something like 200 authors or something, and they're all doing like readings and talks and stuff. There are only like three or four like well-known authors though. Like they have Jennifer Egan, Claire Messud, uh, I guess Tom Hanks wrote a book. He's there. But the thing is, to get into those venues, you have to be a Friends Pass member or whatever, which means you have to pay $100. <laughs> What's the point of that? You know? And it doesn't really matter because I don't care about any of those people anyway. But it's just uh, just disappointing. I was thinking about going to one that was about college novels, but I'd just rather read something. Let's see. Yeah, that's mostly the new and interesting books I've been reading. I'm starting to plan classes I'm going to take next semester. It's hard to say. I wanted to read a Pessoa poem though. Or, uh, Alberto Cairo. Uh, you speak of civilization and how it shouldn't exist. At least not as it is. You say that everyone or almost everyone suffers from human life being organized in this way. You say that if things were different, people would suffer, suffer less. You say things would be better if they were how you want them. I hear you and don't listen. Why would I want to listen to you? I'd learn nothing. <clears throat> I'd learn nothing by listening to you. If things were different, they'd be different. That's all. If things were how you want them, they'd be how you want them. Fine. Too bad for you and for all those who spend life trying to invent the machine for producing happiness. Yeah, I like that line. If things were different, they'd be different. <laughs> it's pretty silly. And today, before I left for class, I usually have... I've always carried stuff with me. Like when I was little, I would always carry Hot Wheels cars. And uh, for a while I got into rocks and like minerals and gems and stuff. So sometimes I'd carry around like polished rocks that had nice colors. But now I carry around books. And I was going around my bookshelves, like trying to decide on the one that fit the character that I needed for the day. And I was saying to uh, my friend that really when I go around looking at my bookshelf, it, it's like it's like a sort of, I see it as like a sort of synesthesia type experience. Not literally, but it's kind of like, you know, you look at a title and see an author's name and the color of the book and what the spine looks like and then you're just like hit with all these impressions that you've built up around the book and you know just going through my bookshelves I just, just like it's almost overwhelming really but it's enjoyable I like it but anyway what I decided on was the modern library classics of John Donne And I just enjoy his poetry so much. <laughs> the first line that I think is so funny that I just can't help laughing so much when I read it is, When I died last and dear I die, as often as from thee I go. But there's another funny one here. The sun rising. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motions, lover seasons run? Saucy, pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys 
and sour prentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Call country ants to harvest offices. Love all alike, no season knows, nor climb. Nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. Thy beams, so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink. But that I would not lose her sight so long if her eyes have not blinded thine. Yeah, it's just... It's too good, really. It's too good. When I died last, and dear I die, as often as from thee I go, though it be but an hour ago, and lovers hours be full eternity, I can remember yet that I something did say and something did bestow, though I be dead, which sent me, I should be, mine own executor and legacy. I heard me say, tell her anon, that myself, that is you, not I, did kill me, and when I felt me die, I bid me send my heart when I was gone, but I, alas, could there find none. When I had ripped me and searched where hearts did lie, it killed me again, that I, who still was true in life, in my last will should cousin you. Yet I found something like a heart, but colors it and corners had. It was not good, it was not bad. It was entire to none, and few had part, as good as could be made by art. It seemed, and therefore, for our losses sad, I meant to send this heart instead of mine, but oh, no man could hold it, for twas thine. Guess I'll end it there. I have some books coming in the mail tomorrow. One Argentinian book and one Polish book. The Polish book was published about a week ago, and the Argentinian one was published, the translation. 2015, so that'll be nice. All right. Bye. Death is a gang boss.